Okay. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Ian Stokes Reese. Um, I'm sorry for the little um, arc angle of people who are behind this pillar who I can't see because I can tell there's about half a dozen of you there. Um, but hopefully you can see the screen that I'm presenting on. Um, and um, I'm going to take about the next 30 minutes, actually probably a little bit less because I'd love to have a, some time for some Q&A questions people have about Anaconda and open data science at the end. That's going to get us on, on time for our 10.30 morning coffee break. Um, so I'm a computational scientist at Continuum. To set the scene just a little bit, give you a bit of my background so you understand where I'm coming from. And in fact, where um, really the majority of people doing engineering work at Continuum come from. Uh, my email signature still says that I'm a computational scientist. My business card says that I'm a data scientist. I, my email signature goes out to more people like you. My business card goes out to people we're trying to pay us money and data scientists is like the thing they want to see in a business card for the person they talk to. Um, but my background is electrical engineer as an undergraduate Canadian. Are there any other Canadians here? I met one or two. No other Canadians though. Um, but anyway, so I did um, large scale data processing, signal processing at the end of my undergraduate degree. Um, carried that into large statistical models for speech recognition for a master's degree. And then I worked at a tech startup in the UK for a couple years where we did um, government data processing systems for uh, processing uh, electronic records for tax filing. And so it was like kind of one of the biggest ever attempts to uh, put these things online. And of course, everybody files their taxes in the same kind of like six hour window. Um, and so again, was like problems in large scale data processing. And then I started a PhD uh, where I really learned the definition of big, um, where I was working on one of the CERN experiments, um, where I was on the computing team for the LHCB experiment, one of the four detectors at CERN, um, the baby experiment with only 300 physicists and, um, you know, as opposed to 2,000 like the other three. Um, but this is for an experiment and a group of people who are going to be working together for most of their professional lives. It's a very tight community. Um, they work, the experiments last for decades. The collaborations are massive and are tightly knit. And so we are creating software infrastructure for um, running on over a quarter million machines that would be running for more than a decade. So stuff that I wrote like in 2003, 2004, parts of it are still in the computing infrastructure that's deployed in a globally distributed computing infrastructure. Um, and it's cranking through petabytes of data every year. So that's like big scale distributed processing and I, that's where I learned Python. Uh, that computing team was committed to Python. CERN is uh, heavily invested in Python. Python is amazing, I love it. And the people at Continuum have been using Python for a long time since well before um, Continuum came into existence. And we're in this world today where a lot of people are excited about uh, what you can do with computers and data and software and algorithms. And um, Anaconda is uh, our continuum sort of collective gift to the world. It's free for everyone, it's free for any use, it's free forever. So that's what we say about the Anaconda distribution. How many people here are using Anaconda today? Great, so most people, some people aren't. Um, I love to hear stories from people who aren't using Anaconda. So we love to understand like what are the situations that make Anaconda like not the right answer for you. Um, so you're using it, you've got a bit of a picture of what's there in Anaconda. We, ha we heard yesterday some statistics on Windows uh, Python downloads. So as you all are familiar, you go to Python Software Foundation, download Python from python.org, and you get like this, depending on what it is exactly, 25 to 35 meg download with the Python standard library. Now just to see if people are awake and listening to me and not doing email or text messages too much, approximately how many Python packages are in the Python standard library? Does anybody know? Have you ever wondered? So if you go to docs.python.org and click on that like modules link, how many things are listed? What's that? No, in the standard library that you get when you install Python, Python from python.org. So, so the answer is about 300. So there's about 300 there, round figures, okay? Um, no, it's about 300, yes. yeah, R round, again, round figures. Um, so about 300 packages in there, Python standard library. Python standard library is amazing. And for those of us who've been doing stuff for a long time where we have to or work in other domains, um, MATLAB or Java or wherever else, every time you move to like a new job or a new computer, you get like the 
built-in stuff, but then all the extra bits you've got to go and download and get them from a million different places. The standard library is like the, one of the crown jewels of, of Python, the Python ecosystem. Anaconda takes that idea and extends it for data science. And so it takes things which goes beyond Python. So the Anaconda distribution, although it's Python centric, it's not Python exclusive. The Anaconda distribution packs in over 200 additional tools and libraries for um, data science, all open source libraries. They're pre-compiled and optimized for Windows, Mac, and Linux. And we do quarterly releases of those things. So if you don't want to be bothered with like doing rolling updates or selective this package, that package, this version, that version, you can just you know pull down the latest version every time we release a new version every every three months approximately, uh, and you get the whole thing. And it all and it all just works. Before Anaconda, there was then thought Python distribution, which got you like part of the way there, um, but it had had some limits in terms of how you could extend it or how you could actually use it, how it interacted with your system. Now, one of the key things that Anaconda enables is besides an ease of use starting point for open data science, it also gives you the ability to work with other people and to work with other computing systems. So how many people in this room are running Linux on their laptops right now? Like not in a VM, that's like what they've got installed. Like one person, two people, one and a half. So this guy probably has it in a VM, he probably uses the VM on Or in a partition, okay, dual boot. Right. And how many people in this, in this room on a daily basis are executing stuff on a Unix-based server? Oh, actually it's a smaller number than I expected. I expect like everybody to put their hands up. So my, my operational reality is I use my Mac laptop day in, day out. And I do like tons of computing on it. And like I love these packed out like Cadillac Macs with you know, terabyte drives and everything. It's awesome. But I also do a heck of a lot of computing on Unix-based clusters and servers. And the reality is for us as people who are interested in scientific computing and large-scale computing, we've got to transition from our laptops to bigger systems at some point. Anaconda makes it really easy to do that because you can have Anaconda, like it's this, this first level, you can have Anaconda on your laptop, you can have Anaconda on your servers. You've got that same starting point. Um, additionally, you're working with other people who are more like on the business end and like Excel is their world and Windows is their world. They can have Anaconda there too. And so even if they're just like dabbling into some of this stuff, they can get it on the Windows basis. So this is stuff you probably already know, but the idea is, is that we, we allow people to like transition between those different environments. The business oriented Windows environment, the more data science like Mac environment, and then the more computational Unix type um, setups. Okay. so. Diving into Anaconda, more than just Python. Today I'm going to talk, uh, in, I'm only going to talk for another 15 minutes, my goal, and then have some conversation about Anaconda, Q&A about Conda, Anaconda, the Anaconda ecosystem. Uh, I want to give you a picture of the Anaconda distribution so you've got a clear mental model of what you, what you get in it. So you're not just like, yeah, I love it, and then you talk to somebody else who's like, I don't know, I'm just going to like homebrew, brew install Python, or I'm going to like yum install NumPy, right? And, and you like don't have good answers. You're like, that seems like a bad idea, but you don't know what to say, right? So my goal is to give you some uh, ammunition so you can help spread the Anaconda love and so that you can help tamp down on the FUD. Because there's like Anaconda FUD out there for people who think like, oh my gosh, it's going to like ruin my life or create all sorts of problems for me. It's that kind of thing. I also want to sh show off a little bit of the bigger like community around Anaconda. So look at Anaconda Cloud. How many people here have heard of Anaconda Cloud before, if I say that? Okay, so Anaconda Cloud, we're going to look at that a little bit. We're going to look at what it gives you and what, what opportunities exist there. And then a few other pieces. Conda Forge, how many people here have heard of Conda Forge before? Small numbers. Okay, so you'll be excited to hear about Conda Forge. Um, and then finally, just so that um, people don't think, yeah, but like, people got to pay that guy's salary, and I didn't hear him say anything about what they sell, so there's got to be small print somewhere. So at the very end, I'm going to just take a couple minutes, only for the sake of like clarifying for all of you, like what is it that Continuum does commercially? How is it that we actually like make money? When are we going to ask you for like a credit card number or for dollar bills, something like that? So that'll be the, like, the very end, just to set some context for Continuum as a company, um, but mostly this is focused on the open source stuff, the free stuff, and the Anaconda ecosystem. All right, so MATLAB, uh, Python, R, MATLAB, and Jupyter. So what's the quickest way to get these three pieces all working together? So I'm gonna like, kind of tell a story about how you do that and show that off a little bit. So what we're looking at here is an environment.yaml file. Uh, 
So this is one of the ways in which you can specify a Conda environment. So that Anaconda distribution that most of you in this room have installed on your laptop, the thing that makes that possible is the Conda packaging framework. The Conda packaging framework is a mechanism that is a platform independent and language independent um, packaging mechanism. In fact, it's just like a generic packaging mechanism. So RPMs are just for Red Hat based Linux and just for installing mostly like operating system level things. And um, PIP setup tools is for Python, even with wheels with compiled binaries. It's like all Python ecosystems. And uh, NPM is just for Node and so on and so forth, right? Um, Conda is not platform specific and it's not language specific. You could put just like data files into a Conda package. You could put like a Jupyter notebook in there. You could put source code or compiled binaries. So this individual package can be for a particular language or for a particular platform. The packaging format itself is very generic and that makes it very powerful. Additionally, the way Conda packages are built, they're designed for supporting generic binary packages that have relocatable dynamic libraries inside of them. So I'm not a computer scientist, and I only have like kind of vague understandings of how this like compiler stuff works and how dynamic linking works. But the basic idea is that um, it's tough to get your dynamic libraries to, um, it's tough to have like not operating system managed dynamic libraries for a piece of software. And as a result, when you compile a piece of software on a particular machine, that particular piece of software is like that dynamic library is probably like locked, could potentially be locked down to that machine, especially if you're going through like an autoconf kind of install. RPMs, they assume they're getting installed to the root of the system. There is some degree of relocatability in there. Conda packaging makes use of mechanisms that all modern operating systems support, which is to specify uh, specific paths for where you fetch your dynamic libraries. Okay, so it's like mini, like mini tutorial in um, package loading. But the effect of this is, is that your operating system is already excellent at isolating software into memory when it's executing and into different spaces on disk and both the things in memory, the processes in memory and the files on disk owned by different users. Like operating systems have been really great at doing that for 40 years. When do we need virtual machines and when do we need containers? We need virtual machines and containers when we need a root file system, when we need a root user, when we need access to specific dedicated ports or privileged ports. Like those are scenarios in which you need a container or a virtual machine. Most of us as data scientists, we don't need a root file system. We only need a root file system because the, the only way we can install a piece of software is with yum install. And so then we need a root file system. That's the only reason. Um, so Conda lets us get past these sorts of things. It allows us to sandbox stuff. It allows us to create very concise definitions. So a definition of a computational environment can be this is approximately half a kilobyte, so like 500 bytes. And that's like your snapshot of your executional, execution environment. So I can share this, I'm gonna show how this is shared and can be shared and how you can even get it right now. You don't need to like snapshot your container and have something even a small snapshot like 500 megs or two gigs or 10 gigs or something like that. Anybody who started using containers or virtual machines, you end up with like a bazillion of them. You don't know what to do with them. You don't know how to manage and version them and how do you ship them to somebody else and so on and so forth. So for most data science, this is the kind of thing which gives you a very concise definition of your computational environment. So I'm gonna to point to a few pieces here. So we've got, this is like our sandbox name. This is our computational sandbox name, Pi Data SF, right? That's where we are today. We've got channels. This is where we pull packages from. So this is another nice thing about Conda, that Conda, uh, from the outset, assumed that we were gonna have some uh, namespacing, right? Like Zen of Python namespacing is a great thing. Let's have more of it, right? Problem with um, things like uh, NPM and uh, PyPI, uh, it's like a flat namespace. Okay, you can like replicate, you can kind of like mirror it and then replace on your own, but there's like a flat global namespace. Here we've got a specific set of channels where we're gonna pull packages from. So the stuff we're setting up here has support for R, things from Conda Forge, Plotly, and my own personal channel. And then we've got a set of packages that we want in our environment. So we want Anaconda 4.1 with Python 3.5 with our essentials, our Py2, Plotly, and this one here is one that I'll come back to a little bit later. We also can support pip installs. Now we can't support everything. I wish there were a dash cran colon. There isn't a dash cran colon, so in fact, to actually do the thing that I'm showing here, I have to do an installation for an R package separately. Um, but we, the point is, 
all of the Conda stuff, it's all open source. It's all, um, the Conda framework is open source. The Conda uh, tools and libraries, entirely open source. So people could contribute to add capabilities to this. Uh, and we can see the PIP pieces here are giving us our MATLAB connectors. So we've got R connectors, we've got MATLAB connectors, and there's one R package that doesn't have a Conda version and I've got a, it's not available in R Essentials. So let's carry on. Um, so here we are, Sunday morning, grab a breakfast tourist. The caterers kindly uh, cooperated and provided us with uh, breakfast tourists outside. So there might even be some more of those at the coffee break. If they weren't all snatched up first thing. So here we're going to create a breakfast tourist in Python. So the point is not to read the code here, but this is the code that gives us XY coord XYZ coordinates for a torus. Um, and I should just make sure I'm starting fresh. Uh, restart and clear output. <clears throat> okay, so we've got some code here. The main thing is down at the bottom here, we've got our XYZ coordinates that we create. The rest of this is some fancy NumPy stuff. But now we pause for a second and say, well, but which Python, which NumPy, which SciPy? So this little bit of code here uh, kind of ends up telling us that story, although I have to admit this isn't super readable. Let me change my, it's hard to get like the line wrapping and font size balanced right. So this is Python 3.5 and we'll notice I'm going to bump, bump the font. I'm going to just point. We can see that Python's coming from somewhere which is actually <clears throat> inside my own home directory, inside my Anaconda directory, and then inside these software sandboxes. This is actually like really on the file system. Now, another really cool thing about Conda environments and these Conda sandboxes is I did a cleanup this morning because I wanted to show some of this stuff off, and I realized that I had like 80 Conda environments. So. Anaconda, the full Anaconda distribution, it's not our 25 to 35 meg download you get from python.org. It's about 250 to 350 megs to download. Installed, it's about 800 to 900 megs on disk. So I just told you I had like 80 of those things. Does that mean I was consuming about like half a terabyte with my, mm, no, not half a terabyte, like 500, like 50, uh, 50, 60 gigs with all of those Conda environments? Another great thing about what Conda does is that Conda makes use of the fact that this is software that is, that is like effectively, once it's installed, it's read-only. You're not like uh, modifying the libraries and the packages once they're installed. So it actually has a package cache and it makes use of, again, things that have existed in file systems for a very long time. We don't need to have fancy container virtual machine copy on write stuff. We just make use of linking hard linking or sim linking if necessary. Only as a fallback will Conda actually copy the libraries. If you're spanning file systems between where the package cache is and where you're trying to create your Conda environment, it'll, then it'll actually have to copy the files. But for me, the overlap of those 80 different Conda environments, those 80 different sandboxes, a single one of them for the full Anaconda distribution, about a gigabyte for me once I've added in a bunch of things. 80 of those takes up about three gigabytes because I have two versions of Python and I've got you know, a couple ver multiple versions of a bunch of those packages. But every time I recreate a new environment, if those packages are already there, the extra cost are just the inode links and not the actual content of the files. So very fast to create, very efficient on disk space. And it's just using your natural file system. So I'm using Python, and this, isn't a, this is a, ends up actually being a hard link, not back to the Anaconda bin Python, but actually like the package cache version of Python, and in this case, the uh, 3.5.2. And then we can see uh, where we're getting NumPy from and SciPy, things which would look just the same as in virtual env. Okay? Again, the difference is here is that this isn't Python specific. We can put in these Conda sandboxes, we can put our um, R or Julia or whatever other stuff we want. In fact, we can even, anybody who's doing autocon, if you just do dot slash configure dash dash prefix equals or dot dot dash dash prefix space dollar conda underscore prefix. And then everything is going to get installed into everything starts from here and down. You look there and you're going to see like a lib directory and an include and a var and Etsy and all those other pieces, right? So you can just install stuff straight into there. This is really powerful. This is really powerful for data scientists. Okay, so let me carry on to actually like showing some stuff off. So, and bumping my font size again. So here we use the matplotlib um, magic which gives us inlining of our matplot uh, lib plots. So I you used to use Mat as an engineer, use MATLAB extensively. I used to use um, matplotlib extensively, uh, but only for 2D rendering. If you're an expert at uh, creating 3D images, 
in matplotlib, then I leave it as a challenge to you for uh, how to interpolate the XYZ data points. I tried like four different things and I couldn't get like an interpolation over a torus surface. So you're stuck looking at 2D rendering um, instead, of a 3D instead of a 3D surface. Um, if you're smart enough, and I'm clearly not smart enough, you can also use matplotlib to interpolate those points over a surface and basically get a surface that you could render. But the point is, is we can inline here, we can do matplotlib, Python. Here's our Python two-dimensional torus. Now, there are also some great libraries for visualization besides matplotlib. One of them is Bokeh, leader of Bokeh Project is my colleague Brian, who's in the back corner there. He gave a great tutorial on Friday. Bokeh is very widely used, coming up for its 1.0 release. But I thought I would, um, in community spirit, show off Plotly here. So Plotly is another rendering, uh, interactive visualization rendering library that's Python-based but gives you interactive JavaScript. Um, and Plotly, like Bokeh, has an init notebook mode here, which I'm using. And I'm able to make use of some SciPy features and some NumPy pieces uh, to create a, a surface and then use Plotly's iPlot function um, <clears throat> to go and render uh, a nice 3D plot in, from Plotly in line in my notebook. Okay, so there's the um, Python part. Now breakfast Taurus in MATLAB. So this is creating a connection to MATLAB. MATLAB is not included in the Anaconda distribution. I have my own version of MATLAB on my laptop. Uh, I do some independent work with MATLAB. Um, but there are things which allow us to bridge to a MATLAB kernel uh, from a Jupyter notebook. And so that's what we've got right here using the PyMAP bridge extension. And then in a very succinct bit of um, code here, we're able to create our parameters for our torus do a mesh grid uh, over a particular range, and then apply uh, those vectorized operations um, to then create a, uh, a surface, um, surface plot. Now this is a um, static rendering, unlike our Plotly 3D rendering. If I had a graphical window pop up, then I'd be able to have something that I could spin, but if it's embedded in my notebook, I'm stuck with uh, just a static uh, 3D image. And finally, breakfast torus in R. So here was one where uh, there was no external way to do this. So if you wanted to reproduce this yourself, you'd need to do an install plot3d from your R terminal. Um, but then using the rpy2 uh, extension and the R magic, we then have a cell here full of some R code, which does exactly the same thing. Same parameters using R to create a three-dimensional surface. And at this point in the talk, since we're more than halfway through, hopefully you're down to half of your breakfast torus. Um, and so there's R. So in a single notebook, in a single notebook, we're able to combine R, Python, MATLAB. You can combine SAS and Julian. Of course, as people who use Jupyter regularly know, there's like over 40 language kernels that you can connect to. Again, the advantages, so when I say the Anaconda open data science ecosystem, right now I've been talking about things that aren't, which we like, we don't own. We're not like the owners of this, these things. This is the, the open data science community or the people who gather here and even bigger than this, than this group in terms of the other languages and other, other spaces. The parts that we're trying to add in are the bits that I was spending a little more time emphasizing earlier around the Conda environments are pieces like this ability to switch easily between these kernels, which are different versions of libraries. So, uh, sorry, different versions of um, software setups. So we can have here pure MATLAB kernels where anything I write is just MATLAB code or pure R kernels where anything I write, you don't have to put a magic in there. It's just like I'm just doing R. Some of those pieces are easy to add in and configure in standard setup, but we also have uh, in this version of Jupyter, I've got a notebook extension that will, inter will see that I've got conda environments and will let me switch between kernels in different conda environments. And these all have different customizations of the software that's available, the versions of the software that's available, the version of R, the version of Python, and so on. So these these pieces are the things that let us facilitate reprodu reproducibility. And so I'm going to I'm going to switch here to um, I've talked about Conda. I've talked about the Conda packages and the Conda package uh, Conda environments. Um, I'm going to cut over to a terminal here and just show you. So here in my root environment, I've got Python 2.7. But if I do source activate PyDataSF. 
I'm now using my Python 3.5 interpreter. If I do a conda list, we're not going to actually read this. 276 packages in that particular conda environment. Uh, and if I do my MATLAB one where I do some of my MATLAB work, this one has only 85. So I'm not, again, the point's not to show you the list of them, but just to give you a sense that these are very distinct software environments. Switching between them isn't a matter of going to some container control panel and spinning up a quickly in a couple seconds a new Docker container. It's a matter of doing a source activate. It means anybody on the system, I, can, I have access to my regular, all my regular file system stuff in the usual way. I don't have to do any funny X forwarding um, for you know, connections, this sort of stuff. Now actually in terms of creating them, just to show this off, uh, quickly, I'm going to demonstrate two different mechanisms by which uh, these environments can be created. So I can do a conda create dash n, and let's say I'm going to do uh, something for, I'm going to do a demo environment, and I'm going to create into here, I'm going to say what I want in here is Jupyter, because we all love Jupyter, um, and we're going to need NumPy, and Bokeh, and SciPy, and uh, I hope I get the name for this right, I think it's sklearn. Uh, scikit-learn is the package name. It might tell me I've got it wrong, in which case I'll probably just remove it. So <clears throat> what happened there was um, I gave a specification without version numbers for the packages that I wanted. All of the, the to actually solve that, Conda went and checked with Anaconda Cloud to see what was a consistent set of package versions plus their dependencies that could be installed. It defaults to the latest available version. And if you don't specify a Python version, it uses whatever your root Python version is. Now, in order to satisfy this, it's going to need to download 16.3 megs of new software. And then it's going to go in, it's, and that's maybe, uh, let's say, 20, 25 packages there. It's then going to go and install about 50, pack, 50 or 60 packages because a bunch of those are already available on my machine. So this is then uh, printing packages from the cache, downloading those packages to create a new one when this is done. So this process will take about 30 seconds or so to complete. 16 megs is pretty small, even on the conference Wi-Fi here. To create this package a second time would take only about five seconds to create a new copy of it. To share this with somebody would be a matter of creating a list of it, and you could then just email them the list of files, like you would email a requirements.txt file. Again, requirements.txt file is Python domain. A conda specification could be much broader than that in terms of the content that's available. So we see here the linking packages stage. So it's going through and linking those 50 or 60 packages. And we can then just uh, <coughs> activate. And now we're using the um, Python from that particular package. So that's the, uh, that's the idea for creating conda environments and leveraging conda environments. Um, now, in terms of actually being able to share those, um, I'm going to take a moment and show you my account on Anaconda Cloud. So anaconda.org slash ijstokes is me. Um, <clears throat> and we can see here at this high level view, I've got a bunch of published environments, including this one here, which is the one we were looking at earlier. And so this is a namespaced environment definition, which other people, any of you, could create simply by doing a conda env create ijstokes slash pydata sf. So rather than having to create a URL with a requirements file that people have to download, this kind of facility makes it really easy for you to share a particular setup with your, with your colleagues and collaborators. It's a really easy, efficient way to do those. Yeah, by default, this will look to Anaconda Cloud for IJ Stokes is like the qualifying um, namespace prefix, basically. But it'll then create that environment. I already have that environment, so I can't create it again. But any of you could execute that right now, and you would get exactly the same environment that I had based on that, um, based on that definition. So that's um, environment sharing. Anaconda Cloud is not just a repository for Python packages, you can actually use it to put um, regular PyPI packages in there, and then you are able to make use of, thank you, you're able to make use of uh, regular pip commands to install uh, packages, and uh, if, so the token part is if you've got a paid account. So paid accounts, you can have private packages, and then you can add tokens and then share those tokens either with build systems or colleagues, and the tokens can have um, lifespans and timelines. Um, 
you're able to then submit your own versions of packages in here as an alternative. Additionally, um, our packages are supported in the same kind of way. So you're able to submit our packages into Anaconda Cloud. You can then access them. Uh, so you can access our versions of our packages in the CRAN channel. But if you submit, submitted your own, or so if I submitted my own, I would just put IJ Stokes there instead. And then I'd be able to install my versions of our packages, my own in-house, internal, whatever versions of our packages. Um, NPM as well. So it's a generic platform for supporting, um, for supporting different packages. So from this idea of, of Conda packages, the Conda ecosystem is part of what enables the Anaconda, uh, the larger Anaconda ecosystem to be big and exciting. There is a community that has grown up just this year called Conda Forge. Continuum contributes to Conda Forge. We did not create or think up Conda Forge. It was independently um, a group of people came together and they said we think Conda is great and we want to have a mechanism in order to automate the building of Conda packages. So I won't go into the details of Conda Forge. It actually kind of could deserve its own whole talk for how you create a package that ends up in Conda Forge. Um, the Con Conda Forge system ends up submitting their packages into Anaconda Cloud. So the packages built here, you end up getting through Anaconda Cloud, but Conda Forge has a mechanism by which you create uh, the software, by which you submit a PR into their repository uh, chain. And they have uh, about a thousand packages available now in what are called feedstocks. I believe the number is about a thousand. Um, it's just taking a little while to come up. So it's a pretty long list. Um, that you can check. And so if you want to try Conda installing something, you're having trouble building it yourself, this is a good place to come and look to see if it's available. And if you want to go and install one of these things, then installing one of these packages would be a matter of, um, let me see if I can find one that I don't think I have installed. Um, so this is zero one here, I'm pretty sure is available. Um, Anaconda.org, Conda Forge. Azure. Uh, so we can see that this is available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. We can see that the latest build of this was a month ago. Um, and it has been built for a whole bunch of different platforms for this Azure. So I could go and I could install Conda. If I just do a Conda install dash C Conda Forge Azure, that will get me a, a version of that particular package. Yeah, so, right, so, well, through wheels, there's ways you can get binary stuff in there. But, uh, I mean, I just use Conda. You know, I use Conda because it kind of fits, fits in an open data science ecosystem, whereas wheels and f putting the effort into building wheels locks me into just a Python world of Python distribution, Python wheels. So here we can see, we see the packages that are, get, the dependency packages that are getting pulled down for uh, this Azure, this is for Azure ML. And the very last thing, we're just about out of time, the very last thing that I'm going to show off here, um, so this is, you see the idea again of what gets, what happens here, 630 kilobytes of downloads, and uh, then they're going to get linked into the package. The last thing I'm going to show off is, um, if I can find the tab, so is to say just in 60 seconds, some words about what Continuum does. So, continu to, sorry, to, to, make, to make money. Continuum uh, has a number of different avenues from which we gener generate revenue. We provide, uh, we've got a strong training team. David Mertz is one of the head trainers uh, on the training team. I myself have run like over, I think, 25 weeks of training for Continuum. Uh, we have engineers who are engineers and data scientists who most of the time are, are like coding, who do training. Um, so training is one source. We do data science consulting and Python consulting. Um, but then additionally, uh, we have some enterprise-oriented products. Our enterprise-oriented products to help you understand and differentiate from what the Anaconda distribution is. They facilitate teams of people working together. So they help, a, they help an organization or a group of people coordinate their Anaconda distributions. And they help, uh, they help companies be able to manage their open data science infrastructure the people involved, the software involved, and also going from uh, one person to a server, a couple servers, to scaling out into a cluster. And how do you make use of some of these tools? So 
anybody could go and build the pieces, and you guys probably can see the ways in which you could leverage some of the stuff I've shown you around Conda to do that. Well, we've done that in a particular way. We've built that, and those pieces that we've built on top of Conda, we've done in a way that's oriented towards enterprise deployment of open data science software, and those are our commercial products. So that's like kind of our commercial story, just so you understand like a little bit where the line is. The software is all open source, and we've got a very rich community around um, a company that's very oriented around developing and nurturing open source technology. All of our core algorithms and code are, are open source. Bokeh, Dask, and Numba are the three most popular. Bokeh for interactive visualization, Dask for parallel computing, Numba is a just-in-time compiler for Python for to CPUs and GPUs. Um, so that's kind of like the continuum technology. We fill in some key gaps in the open data science space for Python, um, but mostly you know, the 200 packages that are in the Anaconda distribution, we're responsible for maybe 15 to 20% of them. Most of them are community sourced. Okay, so I'm, I'm, thank you very much for, for being here, hearing about Anaconda, using Anaconda. I'm gonna say that people have questions, just come on up afterwards because I know it's coffee break right now, but thanks for being here. Thanks for um, doing PyData and uh, tell us your stories and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.